or seven minutes late, Mr. Collins. You kept us waiting 700 years. You can have your seven minutes. One way ticket now, lads. Have a safe journey and God bless to all of you. Hey everybody, I'm Johnny and today I want to recommend to you three Irish war movies that help highlight modern Irish history and independence. Ireland has a great history of good cinema and actors and you should enjoy all three of these movies. Be organized in flying columns. You'll live on the run. You'll engage the enemy in nobody's terms but your own. What's your name? Pat. Whose terms? Pat. Pat. I want each one of those to capture ten more. Starting from oldest to newest, 1996, Michael Collins. Follows the revolutionary and political life of Michael Collins, who fought both as a freedom fighter and a politician for Ireland's independence. Collins fought for Irish independence from the outstart, at one of the most significant early rebellions, the Easter Rebellion, which lasted six days after the British heavily suppressed it with overwhelming force. Collins was arrested for his involvement. By 1918, Collins would find himself a leader within the Sinn Féin, whose mandate was independence. The British, of course, quickly outlawed the party, and unrest and violence grew into war. The movie highlights the extreme violence that followed in Dublin, which was culminated in the massacre at Croke Park during a football game. By 1921, Collins is sent to London to negotiate for Ireland in the Anglo-Irish Treaty, with Ireland to become a dominion. Collins accepting the treaty, and the peace he fought for, would now find himself fighting Irish opposed to the treaty terms, in the Battle of Dublin, one of the Civil War's first battles. Do it! Fire! Fire! Michael Collins is a complex movie that covers significant political events and characters. The acting, directing, and weight of the film is spot on. However, it does get criticism for making fiction of some details, perhaps because it's cramming significant political history into a two-hour film for international audiences. Overall, though, very well worth watching. So that's what caused all the bother, huh? This treaty, this treaty makes you a servant of the British Empire. You have wrapped yourself in the fucking Union Jack, the butcher's apron, boy. 2006, The Wind That Shakes the Barley, again takes place during the Irish War of Independence and following Irish Civil War. The Irish War of Independence was fought between the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, and the well-equipped British Army, including the Royal Irish Constabulary. The IRA ran a guerrilla war, often targeting small British convoys or isolated barracks. Acts of civil disobedience were also common. The British response was to bolster the Royal Irish Constabulary with 10,000 recruits from Britain, who'd become known as the Black and Tans. Most of these recruits were unemployed veterans of the First World War. They quickly developed a reputation for brutality, shown well in the film, affecting public opinion of British rule both in Ireland and Britain. Now I take it. You want me to carry on with this, yeah? <laughs> Again, following a stalemate, a theoretical peace was reached in 1921. This would only be the start of what would become the Irish Civil War, which the movie highlights tragically well, as Irish begin to fight Irish over the acceptance of the treaty. Many Irish felt they lost too much to accept anything less than full independence. The Civil War divided neighbours and former Irish Republican Army soldiers alike. Watch the wind that shakes the barley not for the grand battles, but for the authentic settings, understated and real characters, and to experience what life might have been like for Irish men and women living through these times. Understand this. You're now seen as traitors to your nation. If I hear one more report of any of our boys falling down your stairs, you'll be shot. We're the second wave of Irish soldiers to be sent into the Congo. So far, this has cost nine Irish lives. 2016, the Siege of Jadotville. Ireland has committed to peacekeeping missions since 1958. In 1961, Irish troops are serving as peacekeepers in the Congo as part of the United Nations attempt to stabilize the region after resource-rich Katanga seceded from the fractured Congo. The United Nations forces in September of 1961 launched a military offensive, codenamed Operation Morthor, against mercenary units in the state of Katanga. In retaliation, Katanganese counterattacked an isolated UN military base in Jadotville a town already hostile to UN forces, where 155 Irish UN troops, commanded by Pat Quinlan, 
or stationed to protect the local population. You do realize that you are outnumbered by a factor of 20. See a lot of dead men here. None of them are mine. The movie does a good job at staging the tension and feeling of isolation for the Irish forces. The combat scenes are well done and highlight how under-equipped and outgunned the Irish truly were, outnumbered 20 to 1. Ultimately, the Irish soldiers were not reinforced by the United Nations before the ammunition ran out and they were forced to surrender. The surrender humiliated the United Nations and subsequently the Irish soldiers, who were eventually released, would face harsh scrutiny on their return, being made scapegoats for a failure in United Nations planning in the Congo. The movie is a nice turning point in having these soldiers recognized for their remarkable defense of Jadotville. You're hanging us out to dry. Tell me or not. They're splitting into platoons! Target their heavy guns! All right, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this quick highlight of three Irish films. If you want to expand on the subject of Irish war films or independence, please do so in the comments section below. Take care, and we'll see you next time.